We're going to give a minute or two and let people come in. Hmm. And we're letting some people come in. We'll start in a minute. So welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in the new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on pressing issues of the day. The Authors Forum is a uh, series within On the Park Bench that looks at this books that are of interest uh, or by urbanists um, and recent publications usually. And uh, um, the author's forum is produced by Duro Tadani, architect and urbanist who works behind the scenes to put these together. Today's uh, webinar is going to cover the book Sustaining a City's Culture and Character, Principles and Best Practices with author Charles Wolf, co-author Tigran Haas, in a discussion with interviewer Jennifer Hurley. So you can share your thoughts um, at hashtag on the park bench, uh, www.tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback. And I wanted to remind everybody to uh, save the dates for uh, CNU 30 in Oklahoma City, which is going to take place March 23rd through 26, 2022. And it's going to be CNU's first in-person Congress since 2019. Looking forward to that. Um, and learn how a clear commitment to urbanism, careful financing, and resident engagement can spark a city's renaissance. Learn more at cnu.org slash cnu30. We've got a great program today uh, with uh, Charles Wolf, author of Sustaining a City's Culture and Character, Principles and Best Practices. He is a London based multinational urbanism consultant and longtime American environmental and land use lawyer. He holds graduate, a graduate degree in regional planning and has 34 years of experience in environmental land use and real estate law. He's held lead, leadership positions in both the legal and planning professions, and he has represented public and private clients in property redevelopment, regulatory entitlements, and brownfield remediation in Washington State and other locations. He is founding of he is founder of Seeing Better Cities Group, has practiced at several law firms, and has served as a longtime affiliate associate professor in the College of the Built Environments at the University of Washington in Seattle. He has written regularly for many publications, including the Atlantic, Atlantic City, City Lab, Governing, City Metric, Plan Edison, the Huffington Post, here at Public Square, and other publications. He blogs at sustainingplace.com. He is the author of Seeing the Better City 2017 and Urbanism Without Effort, revised edition, edition uh, 2019, both from Island Press. And Tigran Haas is co-author and associate professor of urban planning and urban design, former director of City Taos Athenaeum Laboratory, current director of the Center for the Future of Places, and the director of the graduate program in urbanism at the School of Architecture and the Built Environment at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Haas holds advanced degrees in architecture, urban planning and design, environmental science and regional planning, and he has written more than 50 scholarly articles, 35 conference papers, five books, four research anthologies. He's prolific. 
Um, Jennifer Hurley is president and CEO of Hurley Franks and Associates and teaches in the growth and structure of city's de um, department at Bryn Mawr College. She's going to be our interviewer today. And drawing on her background in conflict resolution, Ms. Hurley has over 25 years of professional expertise facilitating public involvement in planning and development issues. She's uh, uh, been a new urbanist uh, for more than 20 years, working on numerous charrettes for regional planning, downtown revitalization, uh, traditional neighborhood development, and form-based zoning. I'm Rob Studeville at CNU. I'm editor of CNU's uh, Public Square, uh, their online journal. Sustaining a City's Culture and Character uh, was recently published by Roman and Littlefield, and it provides a comprehensive method for assessing how and why successful places come to be with an explicit emphasis on context. This beautiful full color book illustrates how we can understand or unlock a public place, a neighborhood or city based on comparative experiences around the world. And the listeners can save 30% on this book by going to www.roman rowman.com and using the promo code 4S21CITY, that's the best deal you're going to get on this book. And today we're going to have a presentation uh, with, uh, with Charles and Tigran and followed by a discussion with Jennifer. And uh, after that goes on for a while, we're going to get to Q&A from the audience. So I urge everybody to use the Q&A function of Zoom uh, and ask your questions as they occur to you. With that, I'm going to pass this along to Charles. Rob, thanks so very much. And thanks to you and Diru for putting this together. Thank you, Tigran. Thank you, Jennifer. Tigran's at uh, about, let's see, 10 after six in Stockholm. And I am at 10 after five in Newbury, England. And I am going to enable my PowerPoint. And after that introduction, I simply feel old. <laughs> so here we go. Um, we're going to tell you a bit. We're going to take about 15 minutes and tell you about the book. And um, this book ends with the adage that a checklist is not a dream. Now, what, what do we mean by that? We mean that this book is an invitation to immerse to um, borrow a term from indigenous populations, to deeply listen to urban environments, and to think about space, place, and human association within the city in some very expansive ways that maybe we don't always do as professionals. And certainly, when I was a practicing lawyer, I didn't get enough time to do. So this is a book that benefits from um, a sort of pracademic perspective that merges, I suppose, my previous writing and my career and Tigran's input and Tigran's kind uh, stewardship um, with not only this book, but a re-enabling of Urbanism Without Effort, which we'll tell you about in a moment. So this book provides menus, it provides ways, suggested ways to think, issues to consider, it doesn't always provide solutions, although there's many pages of solutions for those who like tools. It is a um, purposeful attempt to, in a way, frustrate the reader and open doors and, um, and expand thinking, perhaps, um, in ways that many people don't get the chance to do. Now, um, we've got a bizarre montage of Tigran and myself looking, as my wife pointed out, happier in a virtual place on Zoom a few weeks ago than we did in London a couple of years ago. And this makes um, a point that I start out with in the book. That is that place may be something that is simply imagined and it need not be the stuff of architecture or brick and mortar or um, other common manifestations of a physical environment. Now, certainly the pandemic has reminded us of that. And on the right, the book starts out in the introduction with some of you who've been to London know that spot, 221B Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes residence, right? Except it's the Sherlock Holmes Museum. Um, it, it, it exists, except 
Sherlock Holmes never really existed, nor did 221B Baker Street until it was built in his memory. We have similar parallels around the world, but in London also, a platform nine and three quarters at King's Cross from whence Harry Potter departed to Hogwarts. It, it's an effort to help understand that place isn't always what it seems. And then a bonus, not from the book, Dead Center. I rode my bike 10 miles the other day to a Roman ruin um, in Silchester, not too far from where we live. It's a reminder of the transcendent element of urban environments and how they change over time. Being fortunate enough to live in the United Kingdom now, that is something that has just profoundly impacted me way more than it did when I was just an itinerant traveler. So this book, again, with Tigran's support, is a sense, is in a sense the conclusion of a trilogy, which began as a lawyer writing on the side about cities in 2009. It led to what was initially an ebook called Urbanism Without Effort about fundamental relationships between people and place, and an argument that before we go forward, we should think about those relationships, uh, the simple uh, everyday aspects of urban life. It was not a prescriptive book. The current book is a lot more prescriptive, but still not a prescriptive book. The prescriptive book was perhaps my second book, Seeing the Better City, which is probably the best known of the three, in that it attempted to instruct people how to understand the world around them, driven through not, uh, I know Deer is in the audience, not through his um, um, faith in sketching and uh, uh, that process, but through photography, which some people think is a is a, is a shortfall to really understanding a place. But Seeing the Better City has all sorts of menus and rules, but is drawn on quite extensively in the new book. And that's how this book came to be. I began to realize somewhere along the way, maybe I'm the son of a planning professor, and maybe it's when I traveled a lot as a, as a youngster, that places were, or places are somewhat the same. They, they have common elements around the world but they present themselves differently. And um, the hero of the current book is a guy named Plamen the Handyman, a Bulgarian who came to our flat in London and painted a ceiling. And he said, you know, everywhere's the same. There's home, there's work, there's transport, there's food, but just in some places, these things are better than the others. And I, I, I really appreciate that simple form of looking at urban places. Here we see Arusha, Tanzania on the top and Seattle, Washington on the bottom. I argue in Seeing the Better City, not this book, but that these really are the same places in that they're commercial venues with urban infrastructure, um, climate, um, people walking on the street, and lo and behold, women in front of the commercial establishment with their smartphones. Now, this is another one of these non prescriptive, open your mind to thinking about how we relate to cities kinds of things. Now, in seeing the better city and going to Stockholm with Tigran and being a visiting scholar at KTH, and now I guess affiliate scholar, um, I began to realize perhaps the shortfalls of a two-dimensional view. And I was also fortunate enough to have a Fulbright in Australia in far north Queensland in and around the principles of seeing the better city. And I was immersed into perspectives of indigenous populations that opened the door to a much more than two dimensional view of the city. And this speaks for itself. This is um, a very nice square. Some of you know it, Osram within Stockholm, a piece of public art, people out for the evening and less than um, you know, 100 meters away, um, a homeless person, something we see around the world and opening the door to all of the discussions that transcend the two dimensions of who owns the city, um, social justice issues and so on. Similarly, I became open to the difference between what we see and what is behind what we see and how it all depends on what I now 
jump in with the context word, but it all depends, doesn't it, on who's looking at what and from which angle. My former street in Seattle, um, which I left four years ago, as Rob implied, um, had um, a sixplex to the left, which had snuck in through a variance process in the um, late 70s under former Seattle zoning and a single family home next door. Seattle, as many of you know, is one of the cities that is now um, severely re-examining the role of single family zoning and championing um, structures on the left rather than the one on the right. But even a few years ago, there was a big irony here. That was a sixplex that looked like a single family dwelling, obviously, or arguably. The house on the left, a storage place for plumbing parts by a local landlord, wasn't even lived in. Eh, there's something to those stories behind what we see. Similarly, I in Seattle, I often evoked at the dawn of what is now um, Seattle, Portland, and on the West Coast, as you all know, well know, a severe um, analysis of how we best solve the homeless crisis. I began to open the door to arguments about uh, homeless tents in public places, who deserves a view, who doesn't deserve a view, who has a right to a view. And this is, again, a matter of perspective and context. But these are the more than two-dimensional aspects that I began to move into with the third book by a look at notions of change, layers, continuity, immersion, blends, Whatever kind of um, whatever kind of um, um, word you want to choose to point out, excuse me, that the city is not a simple place. We move and settle. We sense the city. We rebuild things, and we travel. It's a blend. And um, these two photos evoke the change in East London. They evoke issues of over tourism in Venice, which have temporarily gone away, but you know they'll be back soon. Along the way, I also began to um, look at um, solutions that some would argue are uh, place champions of the placemaking movement, uh, places where people want to be, places that invigorate urban life. And of course, uh, Melbourne is champion for a place that um, 50 years ago, took on its commercial alleys, laneways in, in Australian parlance and transitioned them into something really cool and vibrant, to use an overused word. Which is the real Melbourne laneway in this photo? Well, in Australia, I asked that question and many people said both. And the answer is the one on the left. The one on the right is in Seattle within the Chop House Row project by a former client and friend, current still friend, Liz Dunn, which she took in the course of a small scale development on Seattle's Capitol Hill, um, something that looks an awful lot like a Melbourne Laneway. She was heavily influenced by the concept. Now, contextually, um, was this even a right of way before? And the answer is no, not really. Is it therefore something we shouldn't do? No, it really depends on the place. And this may be a very successful solution drawing on a um, credible and um, important example from elsewhere. But th the new book argues for a contextual analysis before this type of approach is undertaken. And one thing I talked about early on is the Umbrella Sky Project out of Portugal. Um, which has been replicated. Many of you have probably seen these umbrellas around the world, ranging from on the left of the hill town of Dolce Aqua near the French border in Italy, to a gallery in Paris, to Terminal 5 at Heathrow, to a beach in Tanzania, to Vienna, to you name it. Now, these are magical. Why? They bring life to a place, they bring attention to a place, they make a place perhaps an enjoyable place to partake of. On the left, does an artisan street in an already interesting Italian hill town need these umbrellas? An artisan commercial street, maybe. On the right is an epic 
Parisian gallery need these umbrellas? It's not so much a question of yes or no, it's a question for me about musing about what makes these types of interventions special and whether they do belong everywhere. Open question, open question without a prescription. And um, this is the type of um, uh, dialogue I love to, uh, I love to, to start. Similarly, in the era of climate change and a sensitivity to greening urban environments, we have pre-existing environments such as the uh, urban national park of Nora Jur Jurgarden in Stockholm. And here we see a variety of aspects and uh, different environments within the park. And then we see, although some would argue I should be comparing this with um, Jardin de Luxembourg in, in Paris, um, I'm choosing not to, and I'm choosing to compare it with um, the nascent attempts at greening up Paris here along the Rue de, de Martyrs, below Montmartre. Excuse me, this is one of the nascent efforts along with the 15-minute city of Mera Hidalgo. But it shows, it's designed to show that greening presents differently in different places. Um, the issues are in common, but in order to decide how to do them best, perhaps we look at local conditions and vet those conditions and the local population through co-creation processes before we impose the absolute solution. And there we go. Co-creation um, ranging from a wonderful effort of volunteers in Melbourne on the left to incite um, within a neighborhood that was already pretty successful as a co-created place, uh, showing um, to technology companies and the government what had worked so far. Again, I, that's a bottom-up type approach, a sort of latent uh, in, in, in Portugal, a sort of latent environment moving towards London, the, the, the storefront. We know storefronts are important to retain in cities, but the question is, what should they look like now? Again, this is a matter of local taste, perhaps, and local conditions. And finally, to the book. At the beginning of the book, um, I'm probably most proud of, of, of this passage because I wrote it before the pandemic, but it, I think, turns out to be um, a watchword paragraph for the pandemic over and above the principles that I've pointed to so far. Imagine that the world around you disappear, the urban world around you and the paths upon which you're used to walking, the homework relationships, everything just sort of goes away. And that's, that's in a way what happened to us over the last year and some. How would you reimagine your urban place. And here I make the strong point that you wouldn't necessarily go back to these romantic notions of what a particular city is. However, sometimes we bring those romantic notions as tourists when we visit these places. Again, a provocation. The book spends a lot of time taking apart words that we are prone to take for granted, such as authenticity and character. And there's an awful lot in the book on this that I don't have time to go into. But what's important is to, just as with the city itself, to acknowledge the multifaceted nature of these words and that they can be inherently vague or they can be ambu ambiguous. What do, we, what do we mean when we talk about an authentic place? Authentic to whom? Authentic to what time? Um, uh, did, is this a place of character? This is Isleworth within the borough of um, Hounslow in London? Sure, we see some medieval character with the classic 12th century church. We also see a 1970s edition that some would say interferes with the character of the previous eras, but it's also the character of its time. And we need to cross reference this, I think, when we talk about these places. Speaking of pandemics, um, you know, 
here in this part of the world. Uh, I was fortunate to be on 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 the radio, the BBC in London. You know, talked about my fascination with searching out plague pits from the 16th century, just to get that profound sense that we would get through this. And similarly, where we live now in Newport, or in Newbury, I'm sorry, the structure behind is actually our house. This is in 1918. It looks fairly similar to today. If you look closely, everyone in that photograph has a bandana or a mask. 1918, the last pandemic. There's something about the time and timelessness associated with cities that is very, very important. More on the ambiguity of character. These are various people who've spoken to this issue, Rob Cowan, Mr. Guys here in the United Kingdom, uh, a gentleman who authored a, a study guide for um, what we would call in American parlance, high school students taking their A-levels, Kim Davi, the Australian academic, Daria Akte, Turkish academic. Character is a sum of attributes. It's an assemblage of all of the things I've been alluding to over and above the architecture. It's culture, it's social issues, it's climate, it's greening. Um, I think you get the idea. And when I was writing the book and talking about it with Kigran, sort of, this is a simulation, but I sort of had this page popped up in front of me and it is a page in the existing book in um, the town center of Richmond upon Thames in London Borough, where I looked at all the aspects of this physical place and took it apart, took it apart in terms of what the assemblage was. And that text, which I will not reread, you can scan it quickly, again, evokes the complexity of what we're dealing with. Came up with a method. It's an idealistic method. It doesn't work in all cases. It's expensive if it's fully applied. We have some examples in the book about how a learn-like process has been applied, but learn is an extension of the method that I used in seeing the better city. It stands for look, engage, assess, review, and negotiate. And it perhaps emphasizes negotiate more than any other uh, letter because negotiate means co-creation and the importance of hearing from those who are impacted by a project or urban change, those who know or um, have experienced the um, elements of an urban area the most, those who live there. And then we've got this other focus running through what we call context keys of familiarity, congruity, and integrity. These are high-minded words. This is more the academic part of the book, but it's a construct that everyone can work with, even on small projects, I think, to focus thinking. And in chapter, um, in chapter five of the book, there are some graphs that you know, map out how this might work. Um, we can come back to this later if you like. And then the book has been, um, perhaps not surprisingly, embraced a bit already within academic circles, although some pragmatists have had some great things to say about it as well in the advanced reviews. But um, a friend and colleague um, at Deakin University in Australia um, at a recent conference assembled this. And Tigran, do you wanna take off on this a little bit? Cause this is in a sense, what you called out as hoping we could do, I think when we started on this. I, I think, yeah, it was one of the contextual backgrounds for the book was to see that uh, it becomes an inspirational uh, uh, sort of a open source for academic students and professionals alike, maybe that they can go into the city and study the interaction between city space, city life, in order to acquire more knowledge about the complex culture, heritage of the city, its urban place and authentic elements. And we did test your things from seeing the better city in our studios in the urbanism program, which really was sort of, we called it the neo -Yan, neo Gellian program of studying public life or public spaces. So uh, uh, we really uh, wanted in this context to sort of uh, uh, look at the tools or methods that are offered as inspiration as well as a challenge. So this is something that should be developed further. It's not definitely something that which is a closed, uh, closed thing on the contrary and contributes to something which Rob 
uh, I think, uh, 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 phrased it as observational urbanism some years back in, in, in the better cities uh, e-zine for uh, uh, new urbanism, that we are in, an, in a dire need of maybe a, 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 a structured methodology, how to study places and spaces, sort of like an observational urbanism that would be based on not just empirical science, but also an observational methods, you know, going back from William White to Christopher Alexander, Jane Jacobs, Kevin Lynch, that sort of bringing the empirical science together with the observational methods. Uh, some, something in that, I think, vain. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So um, and yeah, go ahead. I said, yeah, Chuck, ahead, we're starting to see some raised hands. So let's get into some of our questions. Yeah, um, let's do that. Yeah. So, you know, early in the book, you, you spend a lot of time um, kind of explaining how people can understand and learn about a particular place's kind of individual character and identity. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, most of my colleagues and clients are kind of buried in details all day long of drafting that new zoning code or trying to get their subdivision adopted or how do I make this pro forma work? So I want you to make the case for me. Why, why is this important? Why should we care so much about really understanding and using urban identity in our work as planners and developers and elected officials and citizens? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a fair question, and I think um, I was one of those people. Um, I watched um, for many years projects, you know, advocating for projects, advocating against projects, and um, before too long, one sees what the people impacted by the projects care about. And the reason that in um, identity is important, dating back to not only the identity codes that, that were the basis in a sense for form-based codes, but also um, those who've written about it point out again that the two dimensions of place, what we see is not enough. There's also the response of both individuals and the collective within a neighborhood or a city. And all of these things fused together create the identity of a place. And if one can arrive at um, a middle ground, a blend, it's not easy. It's a Hegelian dialectic sometimes pushing together, but a balance, then, then I think places are going to be more uh, successful. So identity is a result of all of these factors coming together. Now, the other thing that, um, that I learned in the research for this book is um, certainly I'm not the only one who says that, and that come it comes not only from urban design or other academics who are looking at the mul multiple forces or the uh, multivalent viewpoints, as Paul Sanders points out about the city, but it comes from people in the um, economic development business and the tourism business who are trying to help small towns survive to know their strengths. Um, and again, identity comes from the slow food movement, the you know, regional um, 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 agricultural traditions, building materials, and so on and so forth. Although we're all too busy to do this, I think we need to take time away from that traditional form of a busyness to do the same. One more story. Um, I spoke to a group of young um, ULI, Urban Land Institute uh, portfolio managers a few years ago. And they, um, they said they were there at a lunch presentation to hear me speak, not for their work, but because they in their work had to visit a lot of cities and they wanted to learn how to understand cities better. And I said, what do you mean you're not here for work? Aren't you here? to enhance the value of your portfolios, because this is the stuff people care about. And so I would also argue that there is a bottom line return upon a more complete understanding of a place. Now this um, kind of focus on identity and, and really understanding it as this multi-layered you know, assemblage of all sorts of different things, 
it's not really the obvious perspective from a lifetime as a lawyer. <laughs> so right. how did you come to this um, perspective on, on these topics? Thank you for asking. Well, I think that um, others have asked that, and um, I always point out to me, for me, it was by a, a bit of osmosis, a family story. Uh, my father, as I mentioned, was an urban planning professor, one of the, really one of the early urban design academics. Um, he was more known internationally than, than domestically in the United States, but he was a contemporary of Kevin Lynch and, and, and the others who are commonly referenced in that era. Um, I got to travel a lot, um, not because I we were wealthy, but because his interests and studies took him overseas on grants and Fulbrights and so on. And I think I was just exposed at a very early age to the multiplicity of urban places and you know the excitement that I experienced riding my bike to the Roman town the other day was exactly um, that form of osmosis. I went to law school because it was the right thing to do. Um, I became, I was in an allied field in land use and environmental law. I was a brownfield specialist. I worked on a lot of bring, big projects, bringing them back to, um, to, to market. And I think my choice of um, sub-discipline within the law was very related to the things we're talking about today and also really informed this um, reinvented career perspective. Now in the book, you're, you're really very critical of what you call the over prescription of formulaic solutions, consultant imposed indiscriminate toolkits, things like that. But you're, you're quite polite. You don't, you don't really name names much. But I, I'd like to explore this criticism a little bit, um, in part because I have been so enriched in my career by my engagement with the Congress for New Urbanism and the, the principles that I've learned from that movement has helped me really see places in a different way and understand places right. in a different way. And um, I think I, I mentioned, you know, when we talked earlier, you know, my context growing up in the United States is almost entirely one of sprawl. And mm -hmm. so trying to figure out how to make places better isn't just a matter of, of responding to the context because the context in a lot of cases needs some repair. So right. what do you see as the relationship between these kind of maybe more universal principles of good urbanism versus localism and local context and, and identity and character? Right, there's, there's a few questions and comments <laughs> embedded within there. First of all, um, I, think you, I think you know um, that I am incredibly kind to see in you in this book. <laughs> um, and there are a <laughs> lot of examples of um, the good things CNU has done. And I don't want anyone in this audience to think that this book is in any way a critique of CNU. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a critique of indiscriminate, simple placemaking tools. Maybe, just maybe. But it, it's not a critique of um, tactical urbanism nor the CNU approach. I've been involved in some of that. I've taught. Um, um, form-based code institute classes, um, you know, and and um, I really champion the report of, um, you know, the, the Lynn Richards era CNU that brought the importance of um, people to the forefront of um, what CNU does. So let's get that out of the way, <laughs> because I think anyone who reads the book will, will have a very, very positive view, and including... Um, how the principles um, came came over here um, to Prince Charles um, and through a couple of uh, Americans who were very involved in CNU, plus Andres being everywhere. So, okay, now number two, um, blank slate. 
I've been asked that question many times. And I think there's a there's a passage in the book, which you may remember, Jennifer, or maybe you maybe you missed it. Um, I talk about the 19 uh, the 2019 Pritzker Prize award winner from Japan and how he grew up in um, post atomic bomb Hiroshima. And for him, architecture was nothing. I talk about um, our collaborator in the book, Kadeen Navarro, who did um, some spectacular art pieces and how she um, envisages cities based on what happened after the Kobe earthquake. Um, oftentimes a blank slate is an opportunity for universal principles um, such as those espoused by CNU or other movements. Um, sometimes they're just as with form-based codes, they end up in um, they end up as hybrids in say the commercial center of a town or something like that. It's going to depend on the context. But one thing that's very important, especially in this era of climate change is, and I don't mean to be sound preachy about this, but I've really learned this and I've seen uh, many urban designers such as the, um, the uh, urban design scholar, Matthew Carmona here in the United Kingdom, come around to the point that, you know what? If there is no built environment, we start with the natural environment. And that can be a spur to the context and identity of a place. And as Tigran knows, because we've collaborated in another session and um, um, there's a landscape architecture firm in Seattle and elsewhere. I mean, there's many, many people who do this, but in particular, I'm thinking of uh, Shannon Nickel at, at um, Guthrie Gustafson and Nickel, who as an element of a, an initial project assessment go to um, the historic antecedents of the, build, of the natural environment to understand the landforms that may have been lost. Um, this is very much an indigenous way of thinking. There's examples in the book about planners, indigenous uh, planners in Australia who begin with this notion. So I think that just because there is no pre-existing Western European or other um, long-term settlement pattern to draw from, um, that's, not, that's not the end of the road. And indeed, of course, um, um, Ellen and June and others with the idea of, of retrofitting suburbs and um, bringing new urbanist and other good urbanist principles to, to um, heretofore suburban environments is, is critical and key. And as you may recall in the book, we or I flip things around talking about uh, you know, um, Amazon um, warehouses going in, former big box stores, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 how, how a Texas town dealt with the loss of its Walmart, flipped things around because the Walmart was the equivalent to the downtown. Um, I've got plenty of sort of counterintuitive examples in the book. And although I don't talk about them in a generic presentation, doesn't mean they're not there. We have Jennifer, a question I... from... Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, come in in just a moment. We have a question sure. from Monica about identity of place. Is identity of place only subjective and does it change from time to time? And maybe Tigran and Chuck yeah, both want to weigh th in. That kind that. of uh, falls uh, exactly in my lab because Jennifer, you posed an extremely elegant question, which I need to uh, listen to again when I look at the recorded session. Uh, because it ties with this urban identity. And Chuck and I, we, we discussed this during the project's uh, evolution because the book is only just the final maybe chapter, but not the final verse. Uh, and it's part of the long process we have had. And when it comes to urban identity and city identities, we looked at it. I mean, the city is shaped with all geographical characteristics. It's cultural level, architectural uh, 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 character, aesthetics, tradition and customs and lifestyle. So even if we kind of, uh, uh, it maybe uh, we, we felt that we were critical of the prescriptions 
we weren't really, but we wanted to say how complex a city is. And then, of course, then you have, of course, the, the intangible one, the phenomenological whole notion of the sense of place, which is so, so complex. And it goes down from each and every individual, because Chuck and I can look at his background in a very, very different way. The combination of cultural heritage, the context, the new buildings, the people, uh, uh, you know, they create and shape the identity. So, uh, and what we thought about also that we really were concerned with the physical and cultural characteristics of each space and each of these spaces evolve. And this is why I get very upset when I hear now the new prescriptions of one minute city, three minute city, five minute city, 15 minute city. I mean, one minute city, I can't even get out of my apartment in one minute. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to evolve and, and, and really get enriched in the city. So it's, it's very difficult because that the, the quality that contributes to the identity of place and enables distinguishing one place to another is such a complex uh, uh, beast. So I think each place is very different. But as you said, Jennifer, there are timeless principles of urbanism and CNU has been one of the organization that's really put them back on the agenda. As Michael Zorkin has said once, there is not a single principle of Congress of New Urbanism I wouldn't sign on because they are almost like the declaration of independence. But then again, when you come to a specific culture and context, and as the question was there about urban identity, right? It's very much to each and every one of us. That's why we were also critical, Chuck, but we didn't manage to write that much. And I think it's mea culpa, my problem, about the indicators of livability. You know, everything from Mercer Consulting to, to all these, you know, how do you measure the quality uh, what, what is a better, which cities are better to live in? You know, how do we do the, rank, the rankings? Yeah, yeah. The and rankings did, and also the, the stats and all that. It's so, so very, very difficult. Yeah. So, so I, you know, of course, um, Peter and I agree implicitly on this stuff. Identity changes. Of course it does. Look at this photo. I mean, um, and these are the tools that we might analyze how identity has changed. Nothing is static in the city. Um, and that's, as t has articulated in different words, um, you know, this is what the beast we're, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're faced with. Um, um, so do you want, I'm, I'd just like to get to through the case studies in the book and then we can keep talking. Uh, yeah, I or did, you, I did want to kind ahead. of highlight, you know, I think the best yeah. explanation in your book of the method is the Persona Burroughs story. Um, it, oh, it yeah. brings it to it, you know, it really brings the method to life. And that was yeah. the, that was the place in the book where I felt like, oh, I now I really understand what you're talking about and how I would yeah. do this, except I kept thinking, yeah. you know, in my entire 25 year career, I think I've only worked on one or two projects that had enough resources to do anything remotely like that. So right. how do we bring right. these ideas in? How, how do we use these ideas when we can't talk to 500 people and spend six months immersed in a place? Right, right. And no, thanks for pointing that out. That's in chapter five. And I, I um, have a, I would argue it's a fairly simplistic or oversimplistic reference to an imaginary citizen in an imaginary borough here in the United Kingdom. And he does all the stuff that that uh, or he does many of the things that are set out in this slide. And I was fortunate in my legal career to work for um, some very well-heeled people who might've had the budgets to do these kinds of things, but they didn't necessarily do them either. I think that, um, I think you do the best you can in the context you're dealing with. Now that's not a cop-out answer. That's a reality. And what we were trying to do, as Tigran has said, is um, an almost open source invitation to say, look, this is a perfect world. This is how we might get to closure about the best way to deal with urban change in this particular context at this particular time. Um, but it's going to be a mix and match. And what, what at least I wanted to do was get on the table, as I think we do in chapters, chapter three and a bit of chapter two, the range of techniques, including charrettes, um, including, you know, uh, Bill Leonard's life's work with the, the Charette Institute and, and many things that CNU already does. 
to look at the laundry list of what we could do. And that's why I wanna to get to um, the examples um, because I think that partially, it partially answers your question, Jennifer. Here we see a blend. This is a coal drops yard at King's Cross, London, all sorts of things going on with past, present and future. And this is an invitation to evaluate um, a more modern attempt to meld the many forces of, of a modern redevelopment project. I did want to mention quickly, um, we all have our phenomenological personal stories. This happens to be a structure that no longer exists in Newburyport, Massachusetts, where my mom grew up and her parents ran a store. And this, um, the structure is gone, it's now condominium, but this whole family story is lost to history, as are so many. And this can make a big difference when we go forward in a place, because sometimes we do want to recreate and remember some of these essences. Now, here's where I wanted to end up. Jennifer, the best example is an ideal example that answers your question. And the upper left hand photo is one of the um, six case studies in the book um, of, a, of a mining town in northern Sweden in Lapland called Kiruna. And Kiruna needs, is in the process of moving most of its core because it's a mining town and the mine has caused, just like in the um, epic American land use law case of Pennsylvania coal, subsidence, and the town is caving in on itself. So they're creating a new town. And this is a piece of the new town, the, the town, the new town hall on the left, and the house of culture, meaning big community center on the right. And there's lots of housing and lots of whatever. But what's really important here is they had the luxury, partially because the mining company is funding the move, for a retired colleague of Tigran's, Yaren Karsh, to go north and move to Kiruna and suss out how the town, the new, what the new town should look like and what the experience should be. And you know what? They did a mixture of things. Kiruna has one of the um, most outstanding rural churches in Sweden. It's being moved in its entirety. But then the questions begin. Is the cemetery to be moved? Are the grove of trees around it to be moved? What about the park bench in the current urban center where the, a couple met 40 years ago? What about the build, traditional building materials? Should they face the modern buildings in the new town? The answer is yes. And a variety of really deep thinking um, analyses of what to do with creating the new town. Now, I will say that the town hall on the left looks nothing like the old town hall, but internally the architects have duplicated the spatial relationships and the residents go in that new town hall and they feel like they're in the old town hall. Why? There's a stairway. There's relationships that remind them of the former place. Um, very surgical. And you're saying, so where's the answer to my question, Chuck? Well, partially it was done by listening. Listening, not just public meetings, but sitting down for cups of coffee with longtime residents, working, you know, mixing in the architects and the anthropologists and so on. Now they had the luxury to do that. But what I argue is that we can all pick up pieces of that, um, that ideal laboratory. And running around the examples um, in chapter six um, that I chose, a group of talented young Irish architects who put together the Irish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale of Architecture in 2019, not the current one, looking at six regional market towns in Ireland and how to bring them back in a very gentle co-created way, how to work with the towns to to return the DNA, you know, we oh, the overused term of the DNA of place. The central uh, below Kiruna is the Bloomberg European headquarters in London, high-end 
another high budget project, but um, as uh, Michael Jones from Foster and uh, architects said to me, we had the luxury not only to, to, do, to do what we should do, not just what we could do. And Bloomberg, after being mayor of New York, brought a pro profound contextual reality to this, um, to this site in ways that we talk about in the book, relocating a Roman ruin, re-enabling a street with local, with funding local businesses at the base between the two sides of the building. Um, another example um, with the role of business improvement districts, both here in the United Kingdom and the US, and then going up to two examples that didn't work. Apple stores in Stockholm in the middle and Melbourne at the top. Why? Apple did not do its homework and Apple did not do what it should have to understand the dynamic changing identities of two very central public spaces over time. So I wanna answer your question again by saying that yes, no way most people or projects are gonna be able to pull all of this off, but they can learn from pieces of these examples. So I have a follow-up to your a follow-up question to your exhortation for us to listen, but I want to make sure mm -hmm. we get our questions from our attendees. Please, yeah, please. Uh, before please. we hit the one o'clock hour, and Marcus yes. has asked us about how do we think about places whose quote character tends towards exclusion? Who who's right. being observed or consulted on place? Well, I would say. Um, the book, not only to the degree that the book adopts a preachy tone about, um, about some of the things you've alluded to, the book also really speaks to the importance of listening to those who are impacted and affected. And the social justice and exclusionary concerns in the current reality of a place are very much what um, this learn uh, method, if you will, also focuses on. And um, uh, we joked in our prep session, Jennifer, that the last thing I want this to be seen as is an old, I started out saying I feel old after Rob's kind rendition of the um, of, 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 of our bios, but hey, this is not an old white guy's heritage book. This is about taking in the multiplicity of a current location. And um, so I would say that if, if the character is exclusionary, we need to call that out. I have examples of um, uh, both in this book and my last book of maybe an indiscriminate application of subdivision controls to uh, a given city without regard to traditional gathering places in the street of black community and how um, uh, an intern in a planning department who was from that neighborhood brought out the fact that really the standard approach being used by the city needed to be entirely rethought in the context of that uh, neighborhood in order to spur reinvestment by the locals. So I'm very much on board with that notion. You know, Chuck, uh, my um, experience is that all places are complex and diverse to some in, in some way, shape or form. And if we're only hearing from one set of people that that's not because those are the only people in that place. It's because we're we're not listening in the right places and in the right ways to hear from the full range of people. Right. I and I, I, we're, uh, we're coming up on the hour and. Uh, 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 this video will be posted uh, online um, on the CNU website uh, in a day or so. Uh, so folks that need to leave at, at an hour point can leave. It's up to the panelists for how long they want to go on. Uh, so uh, well, let's keep let's keep going. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> um, I know Tigran yeah, was yeah. also trying to get a word in. Yeah, but, but, here. <laughs> but yeah, no, but I, I will answer your question. I that, can type um, it, Jennifer. I'll, I'll type it because the question was no, 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 no. to type it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. I mean, I just wanted to say that um, 
look, um, I say many times exactly what you've just said, that um, the loudest voice in the room should not and must not control um, these, these processes. And um, again, there are many techniques that are, um, that are set out in chapter three, including the traditional CNU charrette um, approach that um, attempt um, to avoid that. And that's exactly what a deep listening approach or a, a personal um, consultation approach um, can accomplish. I um, allude to the work of um, someone who's fairly well known in this, uh, Warren Logan in Oakland and, um, and others as well, um, in terms of how to empower uh, people whose stories might not otherwise be told. Tigran, was there something you wanted to comment on? Uh, yeah, because I mean, it's a great question. And of course, the way we move around the cities and, and, and look at the cities, it might seem it's very natural and neutral, but it's very, cities are often designed and programmed and managed in a way that actually controlled where you can go, where you can access certain places and who does it. And the question is, who is excluded? Unfortunately, we have seen poor people, people of color, di different ethnicities, minorities, they're excluded. But that means what do we, how do we tackle that? Urban politics, urban economics, some kind of an urban brave regeneration, that's sort of maybe the important thing that that discrimination, fear of the other and the, the retaining status quo is not possible. But as cities are such a fantastic salad bowl, this is what basically they inherently need. They cannot have that theater. So, so in a way it's possible to do it, but then again, it comes down to the city districts, to the mayors, to the, to the sensibility of the architects and planners working in a specific city. And not just maybe doing a, a yuppie 15 minute city tactical urbanism thing. There's much, much, much more complex things to do. Now, you mentioned that your, your legal career, you did a lot of work on brownfields. And one of the questions that I came to my mind when I was reading your book, you know, this emphasis on storytelling and negotiating, it really depends on residents and other stakeholders donating their time and attention to the conversation that you're trying to have with them. And there's kind of two questions I have about that. One is, how, how do you do this method? How do you do this kind of immersion in a place that has been largely abandoned or is largely vacant and the people aren't there anymore? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's, um, there's American examples. There's um, examples in Europe and the recent year, one of the recent European cities of culture Plovdiv in Bulgaria, where an area that was once um, essentially the um, the the uh, residence of of um, what you know short term shorthand or called gypsy populations, uh, Roma populations, and they've left. Um, how how to revision? I mean, sometimes the stakeholders are gone, and it becomes a more um, a more citywide re revisioning approach. Um, but I think that as professionals, and you know, you commented already, Jennifer, that it is so hard sometimes to engage people, no matter how hard we try. But I think it is um, our inherent. Then this is preaching to the choir and maybe saying the same old thing. But it's it it is the responsibility of those involved to seek out through appropriate means. And if, if it means translation, if it means new and different forms of communication, it, 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 that's one benefit of the pandemic, although it does demand some technology that consultation does not necessarily need to be a traditional in-person meeting. Um, it's a mix and match depending on context. There are, Many, as I've said, there's many different approaches that that I've recited that um, talk about ways ranging from, you know, knocking on doors to coffee to Zoom to um, traditional forms of meeting. Um, but that doesn't get away from the fact that public engagement is sometimes, um, as you well know, a very difficult process it has been for years it, it it will continue to be and i would say that this this book is not 
um, the last word on public engagement. It, it attempts to provide a menu of ways to expose the multiplicity of forces at play in a given urban place. But um, I won't pretend to be a public involvement expert. As a lawyer, sure, we had, um, we had our regulatory processes. Sometimes with indigenous peoples involved, we had required federal consultation with Native American populations. Um, I worked for usually developer types when I was working for developers that wanted to hear from everyone and they funded their own processes. They funded their own meetings and they funded their own uh, community involvement specialists to get people to the table. You know, what comes across so, very clearly in your book is this idea of identity being complex and having many different layers and trying to take many different perspectives, different methods. You know, you talk about both objective and subjective methods being important, comparing different places, that sort of layering of things as being so important. I'd say you could say all the same things about public engagement too. That right. you know the ways that it works to engage people in one place are different than the ways it works to engage people in a different place, and so that yeah. those methods you're talking about for understanding identity are also some of the methods you have to use to find the people. <laughs> right, and 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 you know I I mean I um, for Plum and the Handyman he probably doesn't know he's he's my hero, but I can talk about. Um, the one thing that I've experienced here moving to a smaller city, um, you know, just outside London is the wealth of knowledge that is within people who have been here for many years or whose families have been here for many, many years. And I can tell you that um, um, the, you know, the plumber, the electrician, you know, they, they all have a very superior understanding about what's needed to make a better place. And we need to, we certainly need to remember that. And maybe I, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, it's, this is what Yaren did in, in Karuna. I mean, he, he infiltrated the um, pre-existing social network of the place in order to, um, uh, um, well, we use the word immerse many, many times in the book, but um, I think that it's not, it, this is why the book um, ends with a checklist is not a dream. It's a very um, sincere attempt to call upon the human element and call upon also our tendency just to check the boxes of legal requirements or um, you know, the requirements of an application and so on and so forth. And, and to say, hey, it's not that simple. And now, now's the time for us to, to, um, to remember that. And I think that, um, yeah, anyway, that's. You know, there's yeah. one topic in your book that you, you devote really an entire chapter to. We haven't touched on it all yet. And I'd like to give a chance to okay. bring it up, which is the, the relationship between global forces and local places you know as planners mm -hmm. working in a specific place what what do we need to understand about that well i think um that was manifested i've seen it manifested in my travels um, and you know my reinvented life you know it's not just amazon and the hq2 story which i do tell um in the book through a slightly different lens perhaps than others, but it's also stories of um, global forces that impact local businesses um, in similar ways around the world. These become issues of learning from each other about how to re-envision our high streets as they're called here or main streets. Um, it becomes stories like the one that I conveniently turn to not anticipating your question, but the story of um, um, a fruit and vegetable company in London called Bobtail Fruit that no longer exists in a physical 
setting such as the borough market or any of the London markets, which tourists love to visit. So the question is, a global, you know, the globe has the global, you know, we have multiple forms of global there. We have the 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 fact that perhaps a uh, a fruit and vegetable business is not going to do well at a market stall anymore unless it is subsidized by the municipality. But we also have the tourists who come to London and want to see the old style markets in operation. But then we have the reality, and that is that bobtail fruit lives on. They live on in a warehouse underneath a rail arch near Waterloo Station in London, and they live on as a delivery service. It's the same family delivering to offices and residences in particular during the pandemic with the same customer service that they are so proud of over the years, going back two generations, and with uh, community involvement in the locales where they used to have their fruit and vegetable stalls. So that's not quite a direct answer to your question, but it's, it shows that all cities or you know towns are dealing with these global issues of online retail of uh, of um, um, you know how do we how do we get rid of the automobile how do we do all these things to uh, you know offset climate change and um, I th that particular chapter that you uh, refer to actually spends a lot of time with exemplary local solutions to common global pressures. So we're getting close to wrapping up with the end of our time here. I wanna, I'm saying that out loud, just in case any of our attendees have a question that they haven't written yet. They're sort of hanging around in their heads. Um, Tigran, is there anything on these questions you haven't been able to say yet that you wanted to get a, a word in? I was actually trying to find, uh, and I'll find it, I was sending it in the chat, there was a beautiful article written about the future of uh, uh, architecture education in the, in the US by Stan Allen. I think it was a dean at Princeton School of Architecture for the Design Observer. And he had a beautiful quote, also quoting a book on cosmopolitanism, what kind of globalism is needed today? And it's also very deeply rooted in the context and study of local places, but also some kind of a, a cosmopolitanism which is not artificially preserving authentic local traditions, nor giving in mindlessly to the forces of globalism, but actually looking at the hybridity of contemporary culture that works with tradition and the new forces, sort of in, in that sense. So I can say it in the chat. It was pre pretty nice. Yeah, I, yeah. Mm. And I will say, I will say the book has um, of that almost exact perspective. People who've written about um, over tourism are way ahead of us um, in this regard. And that uh, from them, I derived a lot of the principles we talk about. I also, um, I also uh, note that um, I believe, speaking of Island Press, um, publisher of my first two books, I believe they have a new book on over tourism, which might be lo worth looking at as well. Well, and I think for anyone who's working in economic development, you know, anywhere, uh, it, it it's always struck me that cities and towns are, you know, they are fixed in a location but they are influenced and kind of buffeted by all of these flows, flows of people and capital and businesses that come in and out from around the world now and aren't fixed in a place and, and towns ha have to deal with those changes. Right, and you know, I like to talk about the continua um, that are inherent in under, you know, you applying learn and whether it's in an idealistic all all encompassing way or pieces of it. Um, it you know, there's old, there's continuum between old and new, tall and short, global and local. Um, you know, one could create, and I'm sure many people have quite the matrix of, of, of the various continua um, that that we need to reference when we're talking about um, the particular snapshot of a place identity. So Tigran and Chuck, I have a last question for both of you, which is, what did you hope I would ask that I didn't ask you? 
Tigran, you take that one. <laughs> um, what is the next paradigm in, in urbanism? <laughs> Where are we going after <laughs> COVID-19? No, we, we, that might have been a, a, something that, that I know you kept that, Jennifer, for next term. What, what happens with all these issues in the post-COVID times? Has this really sort of uh, changed our perception to cities and do we look at cities completely different and do we, do we need to change our urban lifestyles after this or are we going to go back to square one or continue the way we're you know discussing cities with different paradigms sometimes interconnecting sometimes opposing and some sometimes differing ideologies or do we go in the same you know happy shiny train uh, like PPS has done for years, as Margaret Crawford says, happy, shiny urbanism, good urbanism, uh, or is it really much, much more complex than that? So maybe post COVID-19, that's something else that's going to come. And I'm sure right. Rob, Rob would mention the CNU next year. That's going to be a big issue at CNU for sure. You guys are going to tackle that for, from different aspects. Right. So many people, I mean, in the interviews and podcasts that I've done, um, that, that certainly always comes up. Um, I think the other, you know, the other the other issue that comes up parallel to that is, well, you know, given um, given the pandemic and given the tremendous um, illustrations of climate change that we've seen around the world, um, and the um, the um, various post George Floyd movements and so on and so forth, what what will become of cities? going forward just is, you know, will will cities survive in their current form, which is a sort of an offshoot of Tigran's question. And I was asked that by a very accomplished presenter, somewhat of a legend in BBC London. And I, you know, my answer was, um, come on, it's London. <laughs> you know, we've been, you know, it, yes. And I think there's a sort of, um, uh, there's a sort of universalism that, that it really involves speaking as to that that question earlier question about do, does identity change? Yes, it does, and um, um, it's I think um, remarkable to think about how we are going to come out of this. And that's not necessarily a, a question you didn't ask. Many of your questions were were real, really built around that notion. I wanted to thank. Um... Charles, uh, Chuck, Tigran, and Jennifer uh, for a great, uh, really interesting discussion, and all of the people who have participated in this. And uh, um, uh, once again, thank you for being part of uh, CNU's On the Park Bench. Uh, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very Thanks much. for hosting yeah, us. Thank, Rob. thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Rob. You thank again. you, Jennifer. Bye. Bye.